Welcome to Plastic Model Mojo, a podcast dedicated to scale modeling, as well as the news and events around the hobby, where we hope to be informative and entertaining and help you keep your modeling mojo alive. Dave, we're back after Memorial Day weekend for episode 65 of Plastic Model Mojo. What is shaking with you? As you noted, it was uh, Memorial Day weekend, and that put a little bit of a dent into my model sphere. I didn't have quite the time that I normally have for modeling and modeling-related stuff. And this is the official beginning of summer up here in the States, and so... Obviously, more summer, more activities, et cetera, means less time for modeling. So I have determined that if I'm going to persevere, I'm going to need to get more focused. I'm not going to sit down in the model room and stare at the model or stare at a computer <laughs> screen. Actually get something done. How about you? Well, I think uh, some listener mentioned, you know, I think it was Tim Cavalier and those pod reviews he's been doing talking about the yeah. first first part of our episodes <laughs> us discussing our our work life balance and I, I think that's true but i think yeah. uh it kind of it kind of uh emphasizes the uh, the reality for us of of what all this is and how it fits in with everything else so um, oh yeah you know my oldest firstborn just uh graduated high school so we had that this past weekend at the front end on friday and and then we were party hopping to all the families we've grown up with whose child graduating as well. So three parties in one afternoon and then had one, went to the lake on Monday and then had a little party on Monday I went to. And so it's been a festive weekend, but not at the model bench. So I'm looking forward to maybe getting back down, but uh, at the bench, but uh, you know, I got a big work commitment looming over me through Thursday this week. So maybe by the weekend things uh, will shape up a little bit. Are you going to launch something into space? Yeah, we're we're going up on SpaceX 25 on on uh well, next week sometime and uh we got to get packed and ship stuff down there, man. You know, we should talk about more about space at some point in one of our one of our podcasts. Don't well, you think? As, well, as luck would have it, that's what we're doing tonight. So, if, if folks can <laughs> hang hang around till our special segment, uh, we're going to be talking about real space modeling uh with a gentleman that knows a little bit about it. So, uh we'll get to that. It wouldn't be a podcast without a modeling fluid. Uh, what are you drinking? Well, I picked up a bottle tonight, actually. Uh, it's actually for our open house party for our son is actually this weekend, this Sunday, because uh, everybody else's was this past weekend. We just didn't want it to be on top of everybody else's. So I, I picked up a bottle of Bullet 10-year. Bullet's back on the shelves, apparently. They got their bottle problem solved. Picked up a 10-year, so I'll have a little snort or two tonight and then put it away until till Sunday. So that's what I've got going on. Well, we know you're going. We'll 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 wrap it up at the end uh, on the modeling fluids, but we pretty much know what that report's going to be. I uh, I don't know if I've done the ten year or not. Uh, maybe I have. Oh, I don't know if you've done. That's right. That's a good point. You usually just do the regular bullet. It may not. Uh, you may not have done ten year. So what about you, man? Well, uh, I am drinking a Spotten Optimator Doppelbach that was actually uh, given to us up at Indy. And we got a couple various beers from uh, listeners, and this was one of them. It's 7.6% uh, alcohol, and it's brewed in Munich, Germany. And I don't normally drink box and doppelbox. I'm a, as, as my wife lovingly calls it, I'm a girly beer kind of guy. So uh, this is going to be interesting. Sure is. So I'll look forward to catching you up with that one. <laughs> oh, that's not bad. It's not bad. That's got body to it like all the box do. But I think I think that'll get me through. It probably will, Dave. At least get you through the listener mail. That's what I was going to say. We better get to that. We better. All right, Dave. We got some good listener mail this episode. So let's get into this and uh, knock it out. First is our good buddy from uh, detail and scale books, rock Rosak. They've got a new book. What's the subject this time? Uh, it's attack aircraft of the U S Navy Marine Corps. Ooh, always a good subject. 
Yeah, it's a follow-up to their carrier-based aircraft of World War II and jets of the United States Navy and Marine Corps Parts 1 and 2. So this is specifically the attack, attack aircraft. So it's going to have uh, vigilantes and intruders and Corsair 2s and... Uh, Great choices. Sky Raiders, that sort of thing. That that tickles the spot, man. I, I love those. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, just, just got... Uh, home yesterday from going to a movie and watching a bunch of Navy airplanes. Ah, oh, gee, wonder what that was. Mm. I don't know. Maybe some listener can figure it out. Like Iron Eagle 5? Yeah, that's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rock, thank you for the update, and uh, stay tuned. I, I owe you an email, so I'll be in touch. Next up is Steve Anderson, and Steve is from, even spelled it out for Matamida, Minnesota. Matumida. I don't think I've heard of that. Uh, northeast of the Twin Cities. So uh, that's up there. Yep. <laughs> well, he got a lot of uh, insight out of our conversation, episode 63, with Ed Barrett, the system engineer, system engineering stuff he was talking about. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of good feedback for Ed. So I'm glad that that went over. Now, that, it wasn't everybody's cup of tea, and I got a little bit of that too. But, um, you know, a lot of people got some snippet out of there that they could they could apply to their own situation. So yeah, good. I thought I thought he was really interesting. So Steve has suggested that uh, we need to add one more category type to this uh, kind of this triage of of build level that Ed was alluding to uh, okay. in, our, in our conversation, and uh, he thinks there should be a category for models you you build to blow up and sink or destroy <laughs> af- after you build them. So this is this is interesting. So. Uh, he's got two sons, neither of which are interested in modeling. <laughs> and uh, they like building these old ship kits and uh, floating them out there, taking turns at them with the BB gun. Uh, I was going to say, yes, that is a category we should add, but it, there, there has to be some sort of cutoff. Like once you, once you hit 18, you can only build in that category if you have kits. That's right. And uh he says it's also a, a, an excuse to get a cheap little remote controlled jet ski to push to push the boats out further and <laughs> and the dra- and the dra- to drag the carcasses back to shore. <laughs> and you know what we, we we laugh at that, but you've got to admit, I know you've got so, almost every modeler out there has some memory of doing something very similar to that. I know I do. Well, the one that comes to memory for me is uh, I built, it was an A4 Skyhawk, but it was a matchbox kit. Ooh. And uh, we had this tree house. It wasn't really a tree house. It was a stilt house. It was about 12 feet off the ground. My dad built it for us when we were kids. And uh, we ran a line from the, the balcony railing of that stilt house way, I mean, it's probably 25 yards across the backyard. And I, I hung that. A four on a on a piece of wire with a sewing machine bobbin on it for a pulley on that wire yeah. and, and put a put a bottle rocket engine up its rear end. <laughs> <laughs> you were an engineer even back then, uh, and it and it worked. It was it was it was we you know we howled and laughed because we thought it was so funny because it zipped down that line then exploded in a million pieces right before it hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you even had the timing right. That's well, that's I, well, that was that was all coincidence there. Well, I'm, for me, I remember two things. One, building those odd scale ship models, Lindbergh, Ravel, whatever. And then we would take them down to the creek in our neighborhood, stick a firecracker in them, light it, and then launch it down the creek. And the creek had a pretty good current. And so you'd go running after it to be able to stay close until it exploded. <laughs> and then the other one, I built a God. I guess it's the a box scale B thirty six, and my brother and I ended up in our side yard, and the thing was doused in lighter fluid, and I held on to it while my brother lit it, and I am flying. And I swear to you, this was my brother's idea, not mine. And so I'm flying it around when it's on fire. And of course, that's the moment my mother looks out of the dining room window and sees me with this thing that's on fire. And of course, because it's lighter fluid, there's half my arm is on fire, too. And uh, 
I got two weeks for that one. There you go. My oh. brother didn't get punished because when she looked out, he was just standing there. <laughs> and he didn't say a word, did he? No, well, he denied involvement. He went he went further than than taking the fifth. He adamantly denied involvement. Probably a lot of yeah, Dave. I was really stupid. What were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yep, or words to that effect. Well, Steve, keep those keep those models. I don't know what to say. Keep those models floating. No, that's not right. <laughs> keep those models sinking. Keep those models sinking. Keep those boys engaged in this. And, cause there you go. They they might take a, an interest in naval warfare or something, and uh, this this might become something you never know. So that's right. Sounds like a lot of fun, though. Yes. Mike Stucker from Sugarland, Texas. Uh, yeah, heard us mention that uh, while we've sprayed a lot of paints, uh, I think we've said that neither one of us has really sprayed a whole lot, if any, of the the true water based acrylics. Yes. Now, I, I may have said that, but I may have not gone back far enough. I think I've I've not sprayed like the Vallejo, the, the new stuff, the kind of avant garde water based stuff, the new squeeze bottle paints. Right. New ish. They're not that new anymore, but you you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I used to spray, was it polyscale? Poly S became poly Yeah, poly S polyscale. or polyscale. Yeah, polyscale. I, I used to spray that with, with some success. That I, was a real tough one. Uh, I said some success, so. Yeah. Uh, let's leave it at that. But true. Uh, but back to back to Mike's email. He uh, he recommends we start shooting. If you start shooting acrylics to do so in a completely different airbrush than the one you use for lacquers. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, and it says, if you do not thoroughly, and he means thoroughly in all caps, clean the airbrush for switching paints, uh, you can get a big mess. And that's absolutely true. Now I, he's at, he's curious what uh, Dr. Miller might have to say about it. And uh, I'd, I'd be interested too. Well, we can ask him. Cause I think we got a, another, listener conversation that, that has mentioned Dr. Strange Rush as well. But, but anyway, I, 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 I think, I, I don't know if you need a, a separate airbrush. I certainly would simplify things, but uh, I, I guess the, the big thing is just to be uh, fastidious about uh, cleaning out that airbrush. Yeah. Well, I do know modelers that, that have that kind of policy. They also, I also know ones who have an airbrush only for metallics. Well, yeah, we've talked we've talked about that a little bit, and that, that one I, I that one I think I, I I would be a little bit more on board with because that metal fleck can hide. Oh God, yes, a lot of places. Yep, and yep. I certainly I certainly don't use the same brush cleaning setups or any of that for for metallics that I use for my other paints. <laughs> yep, I just I've no, just had too much too much bad luck in the past. Oh yeah, 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 and man, when when a piece of that metal flake hits a finish, it just it's like a beacon. It just jumps out at you. Uh, and uh, as far as ordering models from exotic places, which we talked about last time, yep. thanks to Michael Karnaka's question of the episode, which we have another one coming up. I, I knew he wouldn't let us down. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Estonia, and uh, he's going to mention Latvia, Copper State models. Oh, really? Are, are they in Latvia? Are they and, in Latvia? Well, you know, they Copper State, they were in Colorado, right? An Arizona. I thought it was Arizona. Or Arizona. I'm sorry, Arizona. It's, it's, you're right. Uh, and then they sold it to somebody in Eastern Europe. And I, I was thinking it was, well, I guess I wasn't thinking. I don't know. Maybe Latvia is right. See, I had not, I, I thought they were still in Arizona. Nope. They're out of Eastern Europe now. Ah, I, I had not realized that at all. But he goes on to say his most exotic is probably Malta. That's not bad. You know, I've corresponded with some guys in Malta and exchanged because I have a one of my many, many ADHD areas of interest is uh, uh, the Malt World War II Malta campaign, uh, particularly the uh, uh, early year, the hurricane years, as they they call them. And uh, so, I've corresponded with guys in Malta and exchanged information, but I've never bought kits from anyone in Malta. Well, he's purchased a decal sheet and doesn't sound like he's quite got it yet, but uh, maybe maybe he has. I don't know. Oh, he says he's waiting on it, so that answers that question. 
the answer to your question is Copper State is by Latvian Post. So obviously they're located in Latvia. That would seem correct, Dave. <laughs> I learned something new. I did. I was unaware that any of that had happened. Uh, they had moved, but I guess I, I knew that they had sold, but I just, I guess I didn't know exactly where. Clearly I did not. You learn something new every day. If you try. Robert Judson, he wants to give a shout out to a a shop or a business. And it is okay. plastics or excuse me, plastic-models-store.com. And they are in Kiev, Ukraine. And he ordered from them, from them. Uh, apparently since the situation has started over there, the war, let's not sugarcoat it. Special military operation. Yeah, that's right. And he was surprised that uh, not only did he get it, there was a little bit of a delay based on a mistake he had made when ordering, but, uh, and then something needed restocked, he didn't realize, but uh, he wants us to get the word out that they're uh, still open for business. Well, that's great news, man. I'm telling you what, considering all, all of what they're going through, I am amazed that any of these companies are managing to continue to do business. I think it's great. Well, good on them. And thanks, Robert, for, for letting us know. So, you know, I guess if anybody was wanting to order something and was, was hesitant, this might be a, a nudge in that direction. I, I would still be reluctant, to be honest. Yeah, until, uh, because you never know what's going to happen. Something stabilizes, you know. But in the end, it's probably not that much money anyway. True. So maybe, maybe it's worth taking the chance just to send them a little love. Yep. So there you go. Thanks again, Robert. Zach Peace. Uh, let's see. He is from, uh, quote, sun drenched Mansfield center, Connecticut. I sent sarcasm there. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> although in the summertime, I'm sure it's a lovely place. It's probably not drenched though. Cause it probably doesn't last long enough. Yeah, probably true. He says the two brands that come to mind for your des desert Island scenario. Uh huh. One is Edward. I can see that choice. I, I certainly can. Due to the depth of subjects and all the extras that are usually included in their kits, and there's some esoteric stuff for uh, color and markings there in some of their kits. Yep. Now, the other one's a bit surprising, and he says that, but he says modern airfix. Now, he says the, the kits are just okay, but the depth of the catalog is good, and, and the buildability is good enough, he thinks, for, for his kind of level, and... There it is, he said. Feels weird. I actually support both of those choices. Uh, listen, there are a lot of people out there who, who love to knock on air, air fix. And are they perfect? No. But their modern stuff, the stuff that in the what we call the modern air fix era, uh, which started back in the, I guess, the early 2000s, their kits are not only no, they're they're somewhat simple. They're not Tamiya or anything like that, but they're very buildable. They fit very well for the most part, and value for the money. I mean, their single engine uh, Spitfires and Mustangs and Hurricanes. Now inflation has taken a little bite, but when they came out, they were six dollars and ninety five cents a pop. Uh, they're now about ten or eleven ninety five a pop, but even even at that price. You know, when when somebody like Dora Wings is releasing a single engine aircraft and charging forty forty five dollars for it, I, I'm hard pressed to think of the value for the money, especially if you've got a younger modeler uh, on a limited budget. I, I I think the Airfix catalog is a is a great place to start them building. So while it might not be my first choice for what I want to build for the rest of my life, if I'm stuck on the desert island, I can't say it's a bad choice. No, I guess not. No. I got a soft spot too, but for even for some of the older stuff, but that's just me. Yes. Yeah. And it, you know, there's a lot of the older stuff still in the catalog. If you want to keep doing those nostalgia builds. Well, I tend to like go back and get an old molding. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> for reasons. For reasons. Yes. Oh, an hour, at least to the question of the episode from Michael Karnalka from New York City, New York. What's he got for us? <sighs> Dave, this one's really good. Okay. I'm bracing myself. I was wondering what the worst self 
induced modeling injury was that you and Dave may have had during your personal history with the hobby? I've got two. Okay. Well, you go, you go first and then I'll do mine. Okay. Number one, I used to many, many years ago model at a drafting table. And as people all know that drafting tables can move up and down at an angle that you can angle the surface. Well, of course, I tightened it down and locked it in a level position because, you know, when you're modeling, you don't want everything sliding for uh, against you or towards you. Well, but you'd lean on the table. And so over time, you would induce a very slight angle to the table, hardly noticeable. Hardly noticeable, at least until you set a exacto on the table and look away for a second and it starts rolling down the table, rolling off and then slip, uh, switching to um, vertical and embedding itself in your big toe. And that, ladies and gentlemen, hurts, hurts a lot. And of course, it had to be a sharp exacto blade. So, uh, were, were you barefoot? Yes, I was. And now you wear steel toe shoes when you model. <laughs> I really should, you know, because <laughs> let's face it, I'm not. I'm not getting any smarter. It's ama- You know how head wounds bleed a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, amazingly enough, toe wounds bleed a whole lot too, and. <laughs> It, it it looked like, you know that scene in The Shining where the elevator doors open and all the blood comes rushing out? It yeah. kind of looked it kind of looked like that for me, or at least it did to me. Of course, there's a reason my sister became the doctor and I didn't. I hate the sight of my own blood. Or the when they pan back over to where he's he's off the scat man and on the on the floor of the entryway yep. of the hotel there. And yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it was ugly. So you tell one, then I've got another one. Well, mine does not involve bloodshed, but there was a time, gosh, what, what was the model? I think it was the rebuild I did of the old Allen SU 76. Oh my God. Because I was. Rebuild does not do do that model justice. Scratch build. That's a different topic altogether. (laughs) Okay. Point being that I was spending a lot of time at the bench. Yes. And there was a a weekend that I was home alone, bacheloring it for for a little bit. And uh, I pulled like a hell, I don't know, 10, 12 hour day at the bench. Wow. God, I can't do those anymore. Maybe a couple of breaks here and there. Yeah. But the next morning when I woke up, I could hardly turn my head. I mean, I, I was in agony. I mean, cause I had scrunched my neck down so much for so long that I'd pinched a nerve or something. And, uh, boy, it let me know the next day. And oh. it was, it was pretty bad. I, when somebody says something, you have to turn your entire torso to, to turn yep. and look at them. Yeah. I was like yep. that for about four days. Oh, wow. So you need to get up and stretch every now and then, but I don't, yes. I don't t- two or three hours now. That's about all I can get in anyway. So that injury I, I, I've, I've uh, not had that one again, but uh, I, I don't like it when that happens. Well, I I'm to the point where literally about an hour and a half, two hours is my maximum. Just uh, my eyes lose focus and, and it just, it, I, I, you know, I get ex- physically, sore in the back and neck. So, you know, I guess I'm getting old. Now, my next one does not involve bloodshed either. I was super gluing two parts together and it was, uh, you know, two parts. I, I wasn't being overly careful with it. This wasn't something I just needed to get these two parts together. Um, I, so I wasn't using any sort of super glue applicator or whatever. So I was holding it between my thumb and forefinger, and I guess I squeezed a little too hard on the on the uh, super glue tu- uh, tube. So super glue ran down my thumb as I was holding these parts, and I grabbed a bottle of Accelerator super glue Accelerator, which cures super glue instantly, and I sprayed it on the part 
to set the set the super glue not realizing that that creates an exothermic reaction and it was as if I had grabbed a white hot horseshoe directly out of a kiln. I mean, it was a burn like no other. I got an actual physical blister the size of about a dime on the side of my thumb that took three or four days to go away. I mean, I had not realized how much heat that released, and it's a lot. That's probably my worst self-inflicted wound, even even over the exacto, because that burned and burned and burned. I think if you look at the, the distribution of modeling injuries, I'd, I'd say good solid cuts is is right is right there, man, at at the peak of the distribution, and then uh, probably probably super glue stuff is is close second. Yeah, but if anybody else has got anything they think would. Uh, bring a chuckle to the listenership uh send us an email let us know because uh, there's there's no modeler out there who doesn't have one of those stories i i'm sure and we, we, we could do another goose gaffs and blunders dave yeah that's right <laughs> though my track record has been <laughs> pretty good since the last i was gonna time. say then that means we've got to go injure ourselves man i'm not sure i can well, take that at this age or do something moronic at the, at the workbench Yes, exactly. That, that doesn't involve in or <laughs> doesn't actually, involve injury. Actually, most of my modeling at my workbench can can pretty well be described as moronic. All right, moving on. That was good. <laughs> oh, Ed Ed Barreth is writing in our guest from uh, episode speaking of Ed sixty three. Yeah. Speaking of Ed, uh well, you know, we mentioned it. He, he he was wanting some feedback, and and, and uh, I think it I think it went pretty good, pretty much positive feedback. And uh, I got a feeling we're going to have Ed back at some point. Might be a little while, Ed, because we got a lot of other, other stuff going on. But uh, he had mentioned some other topics we might cover with him in the future, and I think we're probably going to do that. So I would definitely like to. He's a good guy to talk to. He's been modeling for a long time. Got a lot of uh, a lot of interesting perspectives on the hobby. And one gist of his email is uh, if the Nats folks are interested in having a NASA table at Omaha, they need to contact uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So I'll send you this link, Dave, and uh, I'll pass we'll, it on. We'll see what happens because Ed was thinking he was not going to be at Omaha. So, Oh, that's that's a shame. Well, can only do so much, Dave. I hear you. Michael Luzzi from the Polish Coast Watchers, the Jack Wiselick Polish Coast Watchers chapter. We hear a lot from Mike and that gang. Yep. The folks up there in the Peoria area. Very active modelers. Uh, I think so. Uh, he just want to tell us at the, the last meeting, there were several of them discussing the podcast and uh, want to express their appreciation and give uh, Dr. Strangebrush some special kudos and uh, thanking us for keeping their modeling mojo working. So Glad to help. And he also forwarded us an article from the Chicago Tribune about uh, Three Floyds Brewery. Yep. I need to reach back. We're, if I have to drive up there, I'm going to talk to those people. Well, you know, your uh, detour on the way back from Omaha is not a terrible idea. You know, it isn't really. It's a, it's a little bit out of the way, but it's not as out of the way as you'd think it is. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking that drive from south of Chicago back down to even Indianapolis. Oh, God. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. I'll drive that section, I promise. <laughs> okay, well, we'll discuss later. Because <laughs> you know after the Nationals, we're going to need to restock our three Floyd uh, stock. Uh, we got an email from John Vickis, Dave. Yep. And uh, he sent us a nice screenshot of a, a Cleveland bourbon glass and a coffee mug that says, someone in Cleveland loves you. It must not be him because he's not in Cleveland anymore. That's right. And a little... 125th scale Lind Lindbergh uh, Crown Vic police interceptor marked for the Cleveland Police Department circa 1995. So he's starting to get into those. Well, Dave, from the email side of things, that's all I got tonight. But there was some good stuff there. Well, I've got one from the from the Facebook Instant Messenger side. Uh, as you mentioned, this past weekend was a three day weekend. It was Memorial Day. So Monday was a holiday. 
a chance to sleep in late. Well, unfortunately, I'm used to waking up at five o'clock in the morning, you know, five or five thirty most days. So my my internal clock didn't know it was Memorial Day. So I wake up at five thirty, and uh, just so so happens that a modeler out of the UK uh, named Alex Taylor instant messaged. Uh, you know, for him, he's five hours ahead. So it was 1030 on a normal Monday morning for him, but I'm up at 530 in the morning. He instant messaged and uh, had uh, a, a couple of issues. Uh, one, he was having a little bit uh, of an issue with the uh, Liquitex flow aid. And uh, I recommended that he talk with uh, Dr. Miller about it, uh, Dr. Strangebrush. Then amazingly enough in the UK, Windex isn't Windex. And, uh, you know, I guess I never think about these things. Uh, I know that's that's American-centric of me, and I probably need to think about that a little deeper. But um, Windex isn't Windex in the UK. Uh, they have something called Window Lean, but it's a different formula. But apparently, uh, with a little bit of Googling, I found out that if you get windoline and add a little ammonia, which can be picked up at a uh, at a chem, what they call a chemist's, which I guess we call a pharmacy. But we but we wouldn't go there for ammonia. But we wouldn't go there for ammonia. We'd probably go to the home improvement store for ammonia or the grocery store, depending. Just shows how weird things are. Uh, but you can actually make your own Windex from windoline and ammonia. Well, that started a conversation where we're sitting here. I'm sitting here at 5.30, 5.40 in the morning talking about that. And then he he again had praises for Dr. Miller and all of Dr. Miller's tips. And, and finally, he had just seen Top Gun Maverick. And uh, uh, I told him that my brother, who happens to have spent 20 years in the B-52 as Bombardier Navigator, that he and I were going to go see it that Monday. He told me that he enjoyed it and he thought I would enjoy it. And he was absolutely right. I will tell you, uh, here's David's little mini review. Great movie. Now it's, it's a little bit of a check your brain at the door. You know, if you're, if you're analyzing it for realism, you're, you're, you're in the wrong theater, but really good movie in many ways, better than the original. There's more of a serious story or set of stories. All of the callbacks and member berries that they put in the movie were all done very subtly. I saw it in the theater. I enjoyed the heck out of it. And I am positive that I will see it in the theater at least one more time. Now, he also talked about Gloss White. Yes, he did. He he talked about the difficulty of painting gloss white, and I agree with him. To me, gloss white is one of the most difficult things to to paint. And I told him what I do is I don't paint gloss white. I paint flat white and then gloss it with a, uh, you know, some sort of clear acrylic or, or clear gloss of whatever type. And even then, generally, I don't paint white or black ever because in – because these things are smaller scale, um, many times the it the colors tend to get starker at scale at smaller scales, and so white and black can actually make something look toy like. So my preference is for white to use a very 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 light gray, and for black uh, either a very, very, very dark gray, or if you have modeling skills from which you've obtained because you sold your soul to Satan, uh, there, there's a modeler named Mark Smith out of Cleveland, architect uh, by uh, trade. Mark is a modeler extraordinaire. And I, I I don't say that lightly. He is one of the finer modelers I've I've ever run across, and he did a a bow fighter I think as a night fighter, just to illustrate that you can paint black by not using black, 
he actually used blues and reds and maroons and purples and ended up painting a black finish on a bow fighter that is just utterly incredible. And he did not use one drop of black paint anywhere on it. So uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in not using pure black and pure white. All right. Well, if that's all you've got, Dave, that is listener mail for episode 65. If you'd like to contact us, you can do so at plasticmodelmojo at gmail.com. If you want to send an email, please do. And if you do so, let us know where you're from. Just a uh, general geography, city and state. If you're North America, city and country, if you're not, that'd be absolutely fabulous. We'd love to know where you're from. And also reach out uh, via Facebook Messenger. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the listeners le- reach out that way. Uh, unfortunately, with Facebook, uh, their interface is not the world's best, and sometimes you miss a message or two here or there. But reach out with Facebook Messenger. I I love these conversations that I'm getting into with people who who reach out to us via Facebook Messenger. Well, we're at that point in the show where I ask you. When you're done with this episode, if you would please take a moment, rate the podcast. Also, subscribe to the podcast on whatever podcast app you use. Uh, Additionally, finally, if you know some other modeler that you're friends with, that you buddy around with, that that, that, that you model with, and they're not listening to the podcast, I'd appreciate it if you would help them find the podcast and get them listening. Uh, We continue to grow, and one of the main ways we do it is by people tell modelers telling other modelers about us. So, and finally, I want to thank everybody who's done that in the past because, again, our listenership continues to grow, and it is it is absolutely due to the current listener base. Thank you very much. And once you've done that and you want to check out some more content, you can do so at modelpodcast.com. Now, modelpodcast.com is a consortium website set up with the help of Stuart Clark from the Scale Model Podcast to provide a single repository for all the participating podcasts. Uh, You can go to modelpodcast.com and find a direct link to our podcast, Scale Model Podcast, all the podcasts out there in the model sphere who are putting out content right now who choose to participate and be in this this little family with us. So there's, there's plenty out there to listen to. You can check them out again at modelpodcast.com. Podcasts aren't enough, or you want something else that's different. You can uh, check out our blog and YouTube friends, Chris Wallace out of Canada, model airplane maker. He's got a blog and YouTube channel. A lot of great content there. Stephen Lee, Sprue Pie with Frets, a great blog, long and short form content. You can get a lot of, uh, Steve's insight into the hobby and opinion and uh, check out what he's, he's got going on there. In fact, Steve just put up a post fairly recently. Steve and, and Chris ping off each other as far as posts. Chris will put up a very thought provoking post and then Stephen will react to it and expand on it or vice versa. And that just happened very recently. I highly recommend you go to both of those guys' blogs and read their particularly their long longer form stuff if you like 70 second scale please check out jeff groves inch high guy and uh he's got all kinds of 70 second scale content there he's a prolific builder prolific doesn't cut it did you see did he send you a picture of the arma uh p5 early p51s yes he did i think there were 16 of them if i if i counted the photo right there were either 12 or 16. And and I just didn't want to get my head around the fact that he actually built them all. Yes. And the fact that not only did he build them all, that kit has not been out all that long. I feel really bad about my output. God, it makes you feel awful. Oh, we won't dwell on that. We'll talk to him the next time we see him about that. But uh, absolutely, you're going to want to check out uh, Jim Bates, Scale Canadian TV. He's always got something funny to say. Yes. About the hobby. And we're going to plug old Evan McCallum one more time. Panzermeister36 on YouTube. Jim's on YouTube as well. I missed that little detail. But Evan, uh, quit quit bugging me about 3D printed tracks, man. <laughs> we got it. Listen, we got to get Evan. Don't stop bugging him about 3D printed tracks. 
we've got to get Evan back on. I would love to listen to you and Evan talk about 3D printing, 3D printed tracks in particular, where you see 3D printing and 3D printed tracks going, what's available. I'm uh, Evan, Evan, reach out to, to Mike and, and let's get that scheduled. Or not. <laughs> no, don't don't listen to him, Evan. Now, the problem is he'll probably cut this out. No, you'll never hear it. Uh, f- finally, if you're not a member of your our national IPMS organization, that's IPMS USA, IPMS Canada, IPMS UK, IPMS Australia, New Zealand, Norway, whichever IPMS, whichever country you live in, your national IPMS branch, please consider joining. IPMS does a lot for the hobby. They're usually the membership is fairly inexpensive. The benefits are fantastic. And uh, a lot of people have listened and a lot of people have sent me emails and messages telling me I've either joined or I've rejoined. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I don't think you'll regret it. By the way, if you ever have a problem with your subscription or your membership, please feel free to always reach out to me because I'm their retention and recruitment secretary. I'm in contact with the, all the officers and we can get any little glitches straightened out. So thank you very much. And there's an occasional glitch with the volunteer staff. Yes, that is right. Now, I mean, keep in mind that the, 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 the national organization is with one minor exception, all volunteer. And these are guys who are giving up bench time to help grow the hobby. They're not perfect. Nobody is. So if you do have a problem, reach out and we'll get it straightened out. Never never add a th- thing where we couldn't get a problem straightened out. All right, Dave. Well, let's take a short break here and have a word from our sponsor at Model Paint Solutions. Plastic Model Mojo is now brought to you by Model Paint Solutions, your source for harder steam back airbrushes, David Union power tools, and laboratory grade mixing, measuring, and storage tools for use with all your model paints, be they acrylic, enamels, or lacquers. Check them out at www.modelpaintsolutions.com. We're back, and it's Wagon's Hoe for Omaha. Dave, we are a mere 49 days away at the time of this recording from the 2022 IPMS National Convention in Omaha, Nebraska. Actually, I knew that it was that close because uh, Dave Goldfinch of On the Bench and I were exchanging instant messages over the weekend. And because uh, he had just talked about when they recorded theirs, it was 52 days. <laughs> um, and uh, and they get a contest like in a week or so and then get to come to the Nationals. So. Uh, I told him I was super jealous of that. Ah, okay. Well, good for them. Well, Dave, it's it's getting close. We we got some behind the scenes stuff we're working on. To get get ready for this. Yes. We still, we still want to tout the trophy packages. Yes. Because that's really about the last thing, man. It's um, it is, and uh, you know I don't know. I haven't checked with them. They're probably pretty close on getting them all sold. So reach out and, and, and help them out, get them over that hump because that is the, that is the big thing that the host chapter has to deal with is getting sponsorships for their trophy packages. Well, what do you got to say about it this, this time? I'll tell you what, in our upcoming special segment, there's a little conversation about the nationals and about the seminars at the nationals. And I want to urge everybody who, is going to the nationals, don't overlook the seminars. Uh, I've been to 26 nationals. I think Omaha will be number 27. And I have learned over the years, and it's a lesson I have to keep relearning, is that the seminars are the hidden gems of the nationals, where you can go and do something like watch an in-person presentation by by Dr. Miller and watch. I mean, you listen to him when we interview him. He gives lots of great advice, but seeing him in person and being able to ask questions at the time when he's speaking, as he's covering a topic, I mean, that's, that's modeling gold. Uh, and there are 
lots of presentations. Dana Bell, uh, most years, puts on a seminar on a subject related to uh, some aspect of World War II aircraft or naval aircraft or whatever. I'm telling you what, that they could charge cash money for those things. And they're all free. They're all included in your um, in your registration. You can go to any of those seminars. Don't overlook them. Well, one thing we got to do is we got to get the, uh, the podcast roundtable rescheduled. <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> Apparently that was going to go down right before we all split to go to night at the museum. So yeah. Hopefully yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll figure get, it out. I think John Bonani's taking care of that. We'll, I was we'll, going to say, John, John can handle that. I have faith in John. Cause I, I look forward to that. That was fun last time. It was fun last time. It was great. And I have zero doubt it'll be fun this time. So just don't bring rotten fruit to the round table. We, we'd appreciate that. We don't want to get pelted. That's right. So if, you, if it's not on your calendar, it needs to be the IPMS National Convention coming up quick, Dave. If this is your first time, I envy you because your first national convention is a mind-blowing experience. I guarantee you, you have never seen anything else like this on, and you know, no matter how many regional or invitational contests you've been to, you have not seen anything that resembles this and it will take your breath away. So, so I, I, I envy all of you first timers. Well, all right. Well, we'll be talking to Scott Hackney again shortly before the, the show launches and uh, looking forward to that and looking forward to, I'm looking forward to the drive out there, to be honest. I haven't seen that part of the country in a long time. <laughs> yeah, but you got to spend 10 hours in a car with me, dude. <laughs> Yeah, we, could, we could record a couple episodes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. The car, the, the, the mysterious car episodes. Who knows? We might do a little recording because there's a lot of straight flat running land. You know, uh, you go west of Evansville, Indiana, and man, that drive gets, uh, that, that gets um, a little monotonous. To not be monotonous, let's, let's move on. And it's the Benchtop Halftime Report. Brought to us by Tackett Z. Tackett Z, the must-have tools for the model maker. Check out what Tackett Z has to offer at www.tackettz.com. And Ed, I apologize. I've been really busy. We got to get this figured out. So <laughs> we will. Yeah, we will. All right. Yeah. Well, Dave, I think you've been doing way more than I have. So, <laughs> well, I have. I have been making a little progress. The B fifty two was in its base coat, and of course, you always find something that you need to fix after you've primed, and you think you fixed everything when you primed it, and then you put the base coat on, and you find that one flaw you didn't notice before. So there's one thing I have to fix on it, and that required going out and getting a little milliput, which uh, I had milliput on hand, and I use it from time to time for very special uses. Unfortunately, I don't use it all that often. And it turned out that the milliput I had uh, had gone bad, dried hot, rock hard. Uh, luckily, Jim Bates saved the day by pointing out that milliput was available from Hobby Lobby up near, near my house. In fact, it was directly across from the theater where I saw Top Gun on Monday. So when my brother and I left the theater, we just popped across the street. I picked up some milliput, so I'm now ready to fix that one little problem and uh, and move on to getting this 52 finished because I have to bring it to Omaha. And then the local club, uh, Military Modelers Club of Louisville, three or four times a year has something that they call the Friday Night Fight. And there's a long story behind that name. And if you if you corner me in Omaha, I'll tell it to you. Uh, but it's basically, instead of having a normal club meeting, we just have, starting at like 6 o'clock at night, a group build session. And we'll have 20 or 30 club members there uh, all building. Uh, you know, the club has all these overhead lights. They've got uh, all these... Uh, uh, building mats, um, 
And, you know, sometimes we'll get food or somebody will bring food in or whatever. And we'll spend five or six hours building and, and, and just shooting the breeze. Well, uh, I was lucky enough to get to actually attend the one in, I guess it was in May. And the problem I had was that I didn't have anything that was easily transportable to work on. You know, all the stuff, the M30, the B-52, or the even the TU-128, were all in a state where it wasn't really easy to move them and then wasn't easy to do work on them once once I did. So I grabbed the Bronco kit of the DF-1, which is the first Chinese intercontinental ballistic missile, which is just a... Uh, licensed copy of the Russian SS-2, uh, well, not intercontinental, short-range ballistic missile. And all the all the this this is is a V2 with an additional section added in, so it looks exactly like a V2, other than it's taller. And so I got that kit and took it to the Friday night fights because I've been wanting to build it. I got it about a year ago. And so I started working on it. And as you can imagine, there are not many parts to this kit. Uh, now, it's got a launch table, and the launch table has a fair number of parts. But the missile itself is about eight parts. So I was actually able to get the thing assembled and sanded at the meeting. So now I've got it where it's in primer. I've got the seams done. It's ready for its first coat of uh, actual paint. I am not doing it as a Chinese DF-1. I'm doing it as a uh, Soviet SS-2 to add to my Russian ballistic missile collection. And uh, I'm surprised how quickly this has come along. If I am lucky, both of these items are going to end up at Omaha We'll see. How about you, Mike? Have you actually been at the bench? Momentarily. Momentarily. Well, I, I'm still working on the bits and bobs. You know, we got that shipment of stuff from uh, VMS in the mail. I still need to get yours off to you. And I was, I used the paper shaper product to form the uh, closure flap and the, the shoulder strap to the gas mask bag that's in the discarded equipment on the diorama base. What did you think of it? I, I saw those pictures. They looked very good to me. What What did you think of the product? I think it works as advertised. And I think the advertisement was mostly from uh, Martin Kovacs videos, right. uh, Night Shift Modeler. I think it's highly dependent on what paper you're, you use. So I think there's some experimentation to continue on to do. I just use regular office copy paper. It worked okay. It's going to, it's going to be fine, but you know, I've, I wonder, you know, if you used a high quality tissue, maybe, I don't yep. know, or maybe like cigarette rolling papers, <laughs> cigarette rolling papers. That's right. Is this going to be our first plastic model mojo video, YouTube video? Are you doing a comparison of all the different types of papers? No. That'd make a great video. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, it, it got to me the point where I've, I got the little gas mask bag done and I'm trying to not paint myself into a corner as far as adding those details to the base because there's impressions in the base to put them down, but like the, the the paper shaper stuff, I, I kind of had to do that on the base. And I was real careful not to let that stuff migrate too far out into the to the scenery, right? Right. Because I, I knew it was going to leave a mark. Yeah. Even if it was minor, it's it going to leave a mark that I, I may have to touch up later. So I didn't want that to happen. And and I think uh, if you watch, well, they, they recommend you do it on an unpainted model. So they want you to do all that kind of work before you actually commit the thing to paint. So there's something to keep in mind. Right. But the stuff works. It's a binder for the paper. It dries, you know, kind of semi rigid. Uh, I was able to separate it from the terrain after it was dry. And now I just got to paint it and, and see what it really lo looks like when it's done. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. 
as far as the base is concerned, I got to keep going. I got to I got a lot of stuff to paint yet. Uh, there's a the little, uh, oh, what to call them inside the ammo crates. There's, uh, there's these slats in there that are used to stabilize the rounds inside the box. Right. So they got all the these racks, the, the racks, racks. they have all these, you know, half circle cutouts in them. Right. So I, I had all those pre-painted in, you know, a, a generic kind of wood color that I use for the, for the crates. But there's no wood grain detail or anything. So I was, I was playing around with some wood grain detail. I, I cut a br- brush off like really, really short. Like the bristles are only like a millimeter long now. Right. To kind of, for example, paint like uh, an, a dark enamel color or a dark p- panel line wash, like to me a panel line wash or a dark oil paint over top of this light wood color. Let it dry the touch then come back with white spirits in this short brush and, and kind of just barely drag it on there. And it can get some good wood grain detail. But the problem is that the, the crates are kind of modeled new and I can't put too much of that detail on these, these, these slats and racks or they just don't look right. And there's going to be just, uh, discarded equipment on the base. So I'm, I'm trying to find a happy medium to where I can add a little bit more, you know, character to these things, but not make them look like they don't, look like part of what they came out of that makes yeah. sense yeah. so no it makes absolute sense that's that's kind of what i've been doing so uh i gotta keep trucking man i gotta keep trucking <laughs> yeah you gotta listen you're you're gonna catch hell if you don't have that thing done for omaha but I, i'm moving forward slowly but I, you know i'm still experimenting with stuff i've never done before so well, you're, 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 that's part of your plan for getting better. You're learning new things. And you know, not everything that you try is ever going to work out the first time. I mean, almost every time I've done something new on a model, when I completed the model, I'm like, okay, I like that, but I would do it differently the next time. Uh, you know, there's going to be some good enoughs on this one and, and take the lessons learned. Sure. Okay some hard knocks to apply to the next one. Yep. And, uh, you know, this is not gonna be the last artillery piece for sure. I mean, we'll get to faves and yawns and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but, uh, uh, I kind of know now I I know a lot of new things. Some of them are going to be implemented on, on this build, the this two and base, and some of them won't be, I'll just, I'll start from a different place and do things a little differently on the next one, just because I know the outcome will be better. Sure. That's the best way to put it. Yep. All right. Got anything else on the bench? Nope. Nope. That's it. All right. Well, that wasn't too boring. We, we got a few things done. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're making progress. It's just slower than either one of us would like. You know, there have been some announcements out uh, since we've uh, done this segment last. Do you have any faves and yawns of the recent announcement, kid announcements? I do. I got quite a lengthy list, actually. You're doing, I've got uh, here, maybe I'm just a cockeyed optimist. I've got three faves and no yawns. I have a yawn, sort of, but we'll get to that. All right. To what I was saying, um, DOS works out of Germany. And, you know, they've re-kitted a few things and re-released a few things. And they've come out with a a release of... uh, a U.S. 155 millimeter howitzer. Now it's a it's a rebox of their wooden spoked wheeled M1918 150 kind of World War One gun, right? Right. Uh, but this is the version of this gun that the United States used, particularly the United States Marine Corps used. So it's got pneumatic tires and steel wheels, and it's a really cool looking thing. And what what makes me gravitate toward this is I've always wanted to do some kind of Pacific Island kind of scenery. Absolutely. With the, with the palm fronds and the ferns and all that. So, yep. uh, yeah, this, this one caught my eye. I, 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 I may actually get this kit. It's, it's a, it's a big honking gun with big, big pneumatic tires on it. And, uh, it's, it's neat that it's kind of unique for, from a world war two implementation of this gun to the United States Marine Corps. Sure. It's attractive. That's I right. The, I know the kit. It's attractive. Well, what's your first fave? Well, Azure From, which is a uh, offshoot of the special hobby guys, 
they have announced a Berloit SPAD 510C1. This is a wholly obsolete biplane from the 30s that drug on into World War II in the in a couple of French units and was actually active with training units of the French Air Force at the time of the German invasion in 1940. And it is a very attractive little biplane with an inline engine. Uh, it was actually used in, I think, the, the Spanish Civil War as well. It just fills a neat hole. It's not the first, uh, it's the, probably not the first one I would have chosen to fill, but it is actually a really, really neat kit. And I got to say, I'll probably pick one up when I see it. So Dave's going to build a biplane. Oh, God. You, that is one of those things I fear. You know, with the TU 128, I'm tra- trying to conquer my fear of bare metal finishes. Probably the next biggest, or probably the fear for me that is worse than bare metal finishes is biplanes, particularly rigged biplanes. Uh, so I'm I'm going to have to man up at some point and do that. So what's your next one? It's an interesting one because uh, when this Russian company first started doing their cockpit interiors, I, I, I tongue in cheek, you know, said that was cheating because they're like pre-colored decals essentially, right? 3D decals. So it's a uh, Quintus Studios has has now come out with a series of uh, single. I, I guess I don't know how they're making them cast or printed 3D rivets. Yes, I think they're printed technically. So it's kind of like what uh, what Archer did. What, with what the Archer transfers right, but Archer's Archer sets are generally well. For the most part, they're set up for mile railroading, so they're yes. they're typical rail car rivet patterns, right? In in long strips, you just cut and put use what you need, right? Well, these right. are all singular, and I don't know. It looks interesting to me. I'll probably get some at some point and try it out. I can see those being very useful. Yeah, I think so. So, you know, they're not the they're not the pre printed and colored dash panels and the instrument right. panels but but these are these are separate individual it's just a sheet at an even spacing of, of, of rivet dome rivets is what these are and it's got to be a lot easier than the old-fashioned way of using a punch and die set to make a whole bunch of rivets and then try and place each and every one individually on a kit i don't know that'd be an interesting comparison to do because I've I've never had a lot of problem with that because I've I've done it a lot, and I've I've got my own techniques for for placing individual stuff. Yep. But w- with those, you're using liquid cement. With these with these things from Kinda Studios, you're you're probably not using liquid cement. No. Because they're uh, they're water slide. So right, water slide decals. I've got some of the Archer, but I've never used them. Uh, I have, and I really like them. I've got to say, they were much easier to use than I thought they were going to be. My initial, uh, I don't know what to call it, thought process is how I would approach it would be to prime the model first and then apply these rivet strips. Uh, this is the Archer ones, not this Quinta Studio ones, because they're, they're more right. individual. And then use a lot of setting solution to get rid of the transfer film right in, into that matte or flat finish primer layer as opposed to trying to do it over a smooth plastic or something like that. Yep. No, that's uh, on the, on the TU-128 missiles that I did, I used, uh, I added these reinforcing plates on the fins and then each, each reinforcing plate got four of those Archer dry transfers. And that's exactly the way I did it. And and it worked really well. Were they dry transfers or they water slide? Or I mean water slide. Okay, yeah. to be clear. Yeah. No, yeah. that's what I meant. Yeah. Archer, I always think dry transfer, but I meant water slide. Yeah. Well, that's my other fave. I'm, I'm interested in checking that out. You got another one? 
I've got another fave. And by the way, I just thought of Yon, so so I'm going to have one more. IBG Models has announced a Bedford QL tanker. This was the standard British tanker on airfields from mid to the end of World War II. Uh, it's the refueling Bowser, and it's uh, it fills a, a real nice hole, particularly if you want to do dioramas. And as you know, our discussions with uh, uh, Mr. Hustad, I, I, I'm interested in that subject in pulling off a successful 72nd scale aircraft diorama. So I can see this being a great addition to something like that. My next fave is on that same scale, actually. All right. Well, it's it's kind of twofold. Uh, first to fight, they make a lot of early war. Right. I think they're out of Poland. They're out of Poland. Um, the kits are really low part count, so I'm, I'm not sure what their designed audience is. Yeah. As a war gamers, maybe it is. I don't know. But... Uh, they just released a uh, the German implementation, the, the Czech 38T. Yeah. T for Czech in German. Uh, the Alpha C version, which is a very important version for Blitzkrieg era and early, you know, into Barbarossa. So it's a, it's a, it's, it would be a desirable one, but it's 72nd scale. So it's, you know, it's tiny, right? Right. It's probably two inches long, if that. Yeah. Cause that, that tank was not a big tank. No, it's not a big tank. But, that's got me wanting to check out more in that scale, to be honest. I think 72nd scale armor is just a real growing area. And, uh, and well, that- well, to, to, to that statement, the addendum to this fave is ammo MIG, mm-hmm. ammo by MIG, has, has started releasing a lot of 72nd scale figures. Yes. And I don't know if they're printed or mastered by printing and cast I, I don't know but you know they look pretty inviting a lot of a lot of tank crews and uh if their if their body proportions are good that's 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 filling the hole i'm really curious to see what those look like yeah that is one thing that steve mentioned when we talked to him about how finding really good figures in 72nd scale was so difficult um and and he tended toward the preser figures and and modifying them, uh, but yeah, if if Mig is starting to do seventy second scale figures and they are appropriately proportionate, that would really add to to what you could do out there. What else you got? Well, one more fave, and then Eon. My next fave is from somebody we've mentioned previously in the in the podcast here. Uh, Vargas Scale Models. These are the guys that we ran into in Phoenix that do a lot of 3D printed. Oh, did it, what did I say? Phoenix. Phoenix. God, what, uh, in Vegas, that uh, they do a lot of uh, really interesting 3D printed uh, kits. 35th scale, 72nd scale, a lot of World War I artillery, etc. They've announced two... 72nd scale Civil War guns. Uh, they're both rail guns, the Lee Brook railway gun and the 13 inch mortar, the dictator, uh, that was mounted on a rail car as well. And both of these things tickle my fancy. And I'll tell you if I, if I see them at, at Vega or at, uh, Omaha, I'm almost assuredly going to pick them up. Well, it's good. He made good on his claim to want to do civil war yes absolutely now the scale surprises me to be honest it it does but then again i can see why now keep in mind if he did this in 72nd scale they're 3d printed there is absolutely no reason he can't do it in 35th scale with the touch of a button that's right that's absolutely so, true so what's your next well it's it's a mixed bag it's it's faves and yawns and it's tacom okay and the the yawn is their I don't know how to sell their their latest foray into armor funkadelic <laughs> funkadelic <laughs> uh, 
Uh, they've got a, a German paper panzer, the Mammut or Mammoth. Yes. And a, a crazy West German sponsored kind of MBT 70 side project, a, a, a twin barreled, a twin. It's like a, a tank destroyer, a, a Yog Panzer. Mm-hmm. It's got 220 millimeter Rhine metal, Rhine metal, uh, cannons on it. And, uh, the VT one dash two. Uh, I don't know. This is all world of tank stuff. Is that where that comes from? Well, I don't know who's influencing the other one. Now on, uh, the modeling news, the, the Mammut has got a lot of screenshots from uh world of tanks because I mean, this was a big tank. Yeah. VK 100.01. It's Porsche prototype. Porsche concept. It was never even a prototype. Yeah, I was going to say it was scribbled on the back of a beer napkin, and, and it was it was approved, but it was not what they wanted. They wanted something even bigger. So, uh, if you get on the modeling news, there's a profile of the Mammut against a, a silhouette of the mouse, and it, as if the Mammut wasn't big enough, <laughs> I, it, it's it's ludicrous. It really is. Yep. So I don't I don't know. Uh, who's going to build the bridges for these tanks? But I have no idea. They're going to be a hell of an engineer, that's for sure. Well, I'll tell you, uh, that's funny that you mentioned that, because my yawn is also TACOM. Uh, they have announced release of not one, but two different boxings of the Silber Vogel suborbital bomber. This is a German... Again, paper project where they were going to create a space plane that they could launch and use it to bomb uh, across across the the continents into America. And uh, again, it was a, a sketch on a beer napkin. Never went anywhere. Um, now, certainly an interesting concept that clearly influenced all of the German scientists that we drug over after World War II, clearly influenced some of their later doodles. But I guess there's a market for this out there somewhere. I really, it just, I mean, high quality, and Tacom is high quality. High quality injection molded for this. It just, <laughs> I, it's such, okay. If Tacom instead had had molded, and kitted a World War II uh, privateer, which the only available kit of a privateer in 72nd scale is a matchbox kit from the 1970s. It's a gaping hole in 72nd scale modeling. And instead of doing something like that, they're doing, again, a beer napkin doodle. It just, it, it, it's a little dispiriting. It breaks the heart a little bit. Well, that's interesting because I actually like this one. It's cool looking. Don't get me wrong, but there is. It's it's a, yeah, I get what you're saying, but this thing, because I think to say it was just a beer napkin sketch is a little. Okay. It, it's a little more than a beer napkin sketch. There was no metal cut. There were no. No, no. There was no, probably no wood cut either. No, right. Exactly. But I tell you, there's two boxings of this thing. And and, and the one, the, the silver fogel as itself, silver bird. Yeah. That one's not, not too interesting. But I tell you, the other boxing with the atomic payload suite. Yep. And and they've the box art has the plane and the you know typical Luftwaffe splinter kind of camo with the yellow yeah. bands and and yeah. wing. Can edge. you can you tell me why you're camouflaging a space plane? Well, it's, it's going to sit on the ground most of its life. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, and it's a, such a neat looking aircraft. It's, it's it's like it's flat on the bottom, but it's got this almost perfect curvature to the top from, from nose to tail. Yep. It, yeah. it lift the early lifting bodies, which yes. our interview will actually mention. So I don't know. I like that one. Am I going to buy it? No, probably not. But it's kind of cool. I, I understand. Yes, it is cool looking. Well, no there, doubt. Th- it, you got anything else? Nope, that's it. <laughs>
Well, I've got one more I want to mention, and I, I don't, right. know, I don't I, this is neither a fave nor a yawn. Okay. We talked a little bit about 16th scale last, well, a couple episodes ago with Evan. Right. And he, he yawned the, the trumpeter Yog Panther. Right. Fair enough. Well, a couple of weeks ago, Andy's Hobby Headquarters has announced their foray into kit brand. Mm-hmm. And they've announced an M4A3E8, you know, Easy 8 Sherman. Right. And, you know, he's, he's got his video, very popular video uh, series on, on YouTube. So he's, he's, he's made a lot of press for himself about this kit. And, you know, that's all great. He seems excited about it, and I would be too. But the same week that video came out, I Heart Kit or I Love Kit right. announced the same thing. So, pun 100% intended. I, I'm hoping Andy didn't get Shanghai <laughs> on this uh, 16th scale kit branding because I. We'll see what happens. I, I see. I assumed when I saw that that he was working with them, and they're just announcing the same kit he's announcing, and it's going to be like a co-brand or something like that. But I certainly understand your hesitation regarding some of the business practices of some of the companies over in China. Because his his kit's coming with ABC as extras, and this this other one is coming with not ABC but B and C and X Y Z. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm going to be real curious what the price points are on these two kits, and yeah, that's I don't know. Well, uh, look, for his sake, I hope it goes well. I hope it's very successful. Oh yeah, certainly. And 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 I. I hope he doesn't get Shanghai, but I know you having dealt in militaria and reproductions and all of that, or at least been adjacent to it, know all of the horror stories related to trying to protect your IP when things are being made in China. That's right. We'll keep our fingers crossed for him. That's right. We'll see how it goes. He He's alluding in the video, this was the first of more, so... Good luck, Andy. Yes, good luck, Andy. Wish you well. <laughs> I, I really hope that that uh, that doesn't go bad for him. But uh, yeah, I'm 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 real curious. I'll just say that. Yeah. Well, well, that's it for faves and yawns. We really beat that one to death this time. So let's go ahead and get into our special segment tonight, Dave. Our special segment tonight is dealing with real space modeling, and we got a conversation with Mike Mikowski from Gilbert, Arizona. And uh, he's been dealing with this subject for a long time, Dave. And uh, let's get into that. Sounds great. Well, Dave, we got a special guest tonight. And uh, we're not talking about a galaxy far, far away or <laughs> or uh, places no man has gone before. We're talking about real space modeling tonight. And uh, I guess that would include everything from about six seconds ago until the early post-war era, World War II. And uh, with us tonight is Mike Mikowski from Gilbert, Arizona. Mike, how you doing tonight? Hey, guys. Good evening. We're, I'm doing great here. Well, this is a, a genre that we've not touched on, and it's interesting because uh, Dave and I have both, well, he's dabbled a little bit. I've yet acquired a few kits a- along this genre, but uh, haven't really delved into it too much yet. And uh, based on your background information, looks like you've been doing this uh, since you've been slapping plastic together. That's exactly right. It's my favorite topic. And you, uh, you sent us a little background information. You've been uh, retired from the space industry, which I've I just joined actually a year ago. So that's kind of interesting. That's kind of what picked my own interest in in this genre. So, won't you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into real space as a as your primary modeling genre? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm you know what you might call a child of Apollo. You know. Born in the 50s, grew up in the 60s with, you know, Apollo and Mercury and Gemini shots where the nuns would roll a TV in in the classroom <laughs> so we could watch the astronauts go up. 
and um, grew up with all that, got inspired, got inspired by Star Trek. And it was like, okay, I want to be part of this. So, um, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut or an engineer or something or an astronomer. And I kind of realized, eh, there's not many astronauts. That's kind of, that's kind of a long shot. Uh, astronomers, that's really sciencey, and there's not many jobs in astronomers, but, uh, these NASA guys and all those NASA contractors, they need engineers to build spaceships. So that's the route I went, went to engineering school, got electrical degree. Uh, the, the, I think one of the keys that got me in the industry was, uh, I finagled a co-op work sessions with NASA at in their Huntsville facility back in the 1970s. These are where you take a semester off of college and go work somewhere and, sure. and you get some money and you get real hands-on industry experience. So when you get your degree, you can waive all that experience and you get uh, much better pickings for jobs. Uh, and along with that, I went to school at the University of Arizona in Tucson, which is a big astronomy center. There's observatories out there, a lot of astronomy research, which took some astronomy classes. The idea being, hey, I know a little bit about what we're studying, what NASA's studying, and uh, maybe I can work on some of the instruments or payloads for these uh, satellites and eventually shuttle payloads and give me a little edge on that. So um, out of school, I got a job with McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis, uh, worked on some space shuttle uh, things. We worked on uh, some other uh, R&D projects. We were trying to get into the satellite business, but everybody else was steps ahead of us. So um, after a while, that kind of ran out. And uh, I did work on some uh, hypersonic uh, research aircraft. I don't know if you guys remember the X-30 National Aerospace plane in the early 80s. It was going to go runway to orbit. Oh, yes. And, yeah, yeah. And they need, of course, you know, all those uh, advanced programs need electrical people as well. And I worked on electrical system for that. That was a fun program. And uh, worked on some other kind of high techy things. Uh, eventually, uh, the St. Louis work ran dry. Uh, they had an office out at NASA Goddard in Maryland. So I went out there and supported as a contractor some of NASA's programs, got to know those people. And at that time, my parents and in-laws lived out in the Phoenix area. And McDonald had partnered as a subcontractor to Motorola, who was building this crazy thing called Iridium, which was a, a, a 77 satellite constellation for uh, real-time communications anywhere on the planet. And uh, they needed people to work on that out in their Arizona office. So, oh, I could out, be out there near family and work on a cutting edge space program. So we moved to Arizona, been there ever since, uh, shuffled jobs a few times when when uh, the Iridium program was wrapped up. Uh, a lot of people went to a little company out here called Spectrum Astro, who was doing uh, uh, missions, little satellites for NASA. That eventually grew, grew so well that General Dynamics bought them, moved them to another division. That was so successful building stuff for NASA that uh, Orbital Sciences bought them. And then uh, that was so successful that they merged with ATK. And that was so successful that Northrop Grumman got bought them. And that's when I retired. <laughs> so I was doing like the same job and I had seven different badges. But we were building stuff for <laughs> NASA and uh, it was a great career. I had a lot of, a lot of fun, fun experiences. And, and so I've been very fortunate and all along I'm building space models, you know, all along when I started at McDonnell Douglas, the guys who were mentoring me and work, I was working for 10 years earlier, they were flying Gemini capsules. This is because I started there in the late seventies, you know, and, and so mid late sixties is when they were flying Gemini. And, and these are the guys who built and designed Gemini and I'm working for them. And over time, you know, they start, getting rid of stuff and thinning their files. And by then they knew I was kind of a space geek and interested in that history. And I could go to the corporate library and pull documents out. And, and sometimes they thin their files. So I go dumpster diving and get stuff that they were throwing out. Got a lot of interesting stuff that way. And uh, so, you know, I was around all that and, you know, I was around the, the stuff when I was a Huntsville co-op was when the shuttle was starting I was in Huntsville when Skylab was launched. Uh, just just being around all that and growing up with it, you know, I wanted to build models of it. You know, back in the day, I scratch built a Skylab model. Uh, so I've you know, just been doing that all the way along. So I've been very fortunate, I'll admit that, to have had a, a, a nice career in the aerospace industry, working on spacecraft and a nice 
hobby uh, building models of historical spacecraft. And because I had access to all this cool stuff and was with a bunch of guys in St. Louis who had a, a penchant for publishing articles and magazine type things, I felt obliged to share this with my fellow modelers. So we wrote articles about Gemini and Mercury and other programs. And, and that evolved into my, my self-published Space in Miniature series of reference books for space modelers that I document all this stuff in and, and make it available to other people interested in the same topic. So that's well, where we are. Something you said, Ray, what peaked is the first question I was going to ask you, which is that with an interest in real space modeling, when you were modeling, you know, were you just getting into the real space modeling stuff would be what, the 19, late 60s, early 70s? Late 60s. The first space model, well, you know, you always build the Ravel, Mercury, and Gemini capsules back when you're sure. just glued them together. The first scratch built model I did was the um, Ranger Lunar Probe made out of some cardboard tubes, some old pieces of car models. That and the Surveyor Lunar Landing Probe, the landing pads were hubcaps from cars and swizzle stick wooden dowels and pieces of cardboard and little little uh, spheres from beads. I built those in junior high back in the late well, 60s. And that, that's, that actually is my point. Unlike a guy who gets into armor modeling or aircraft modeling, in the you know in the sixties or early seventies, you had tons of stuff to build. Whereas if you're into a real space back way back when, not to make us both sound way too old, but there was a very limited number of real space kits exactly to build. Exactly, and that's been the big challenge over the years. Um, you know, you, you had a Mercury and Gemini, you had Saturn V, uh, Airfix had a Saturn 1B, you know, there were the military missiles and stuff and some, the Strombecker and some of these other theoretical things from the fifties even, which right. are kind of cool. I, I wish I had stuff like that now, but you know, you had a space shuttle kit come out and they were kind of crude, but you're right. There, there's not much in that genre. So if you want to build something notable, some satellites, some, a space station or a sky lab or something, you have, you're on your own. You have to scratch it yourself. Over time, but this is like by the 80s, some of these garage companies would come along. Guys would put, put out resin kits or vacuum form kits. Early on, they weren't very good, but over time, more of those became available. And and today is really a golden age. There's all that's sorts exactly sorts what of I was stuff out there. Yeah, that's I was gonna say. The last ten years uh, have been fantastic as far as real space goes. Yeah. Uh, it's you know we're we're now getting satellites. We're getting uh, you know international space station stuff. We're getting. I imagine, I mean, I'm just waiting for the SpaceX Falcon 9 and the uh, and the Dragon capsule and then now Boeing's Starliner. Yeah, I'm, I'm really disappointed those haven't come out yet. I think it's a licensing issue. There are people putting stuff out, you know, again, some of the resin shops. They're kind of semi-unauthorized, but right. until somebody stops them, you know, they'll those are available, but... It's not like you can go to your mail order hobby shop and order those from them. You got to work with no. individuals for the most part. Um, maybe at some point we can mention some of the, the, the major ones that are uh, out there that have oh, yeah. legit uh, things to offer. Did you ever go through a phase where you went away from building real space into other genres, or was it pretty much real space? all the time to the exclusion of aircraft or cars or armor or whatever. Well, I'm also an airplane freak. I, um, okay. I, I, I didn't have, I, I never joined the military. I, I didn't have close friends like that were pilots or anything, but I always liked oddball aircraft. I always liked experimental stuff. 
one of a kind. And, and some of this is just kind of history digging. You know, I, I remember getting this little booklet from an early visit to the Air Force Museum. And they had a list of like every U.S. aircraft type that was out there. And yep. I see all these, you know, YF-94 or what the heck's that? Or oh, YF-96, you know, yeah. what's that? You know, what's F-103? You know, what What are all these odd designations that I, that never got built? So you start looking at that. And, wow, that's really interesting, you know. And um, so I, I've always built experimental and one-offs or prototypes. So I do uh, enjoy building aircraft. It's mostly U.S. Air Force 50s and 60s and one of a kind. I have also have a series going uh, based on my uh, McDonald heritage. Basically, I'm trying to build anything and everything that they built in St. Louis, including things that they only built one or two of, um, like the Model 119 uh, concept uh, executive Air Force transport. It was a competitor to the uh, Lockheed um what was it? The, uh, the, not the Lodestar, their, their, uh, executive jet. And, um, oh, uh, not TriStar. What the no. hell? Yeah. I can't remember it. Off yeah. The top of but my you head. know, it was, it was, th- there's that they built helicopters in St. Louis there, you know, the uh, XF 88, the goblin, the little XF 85 parasite fighter. They, the, the McDonald in the fifties and sixties was doing some crazy stuff. And, and there's some resin kits from like Fantastic Plastic or Anagram of a lot of these concepts. And I've been building those. So I got like a couple of shelves of all McDonald projects and not just your F4 and F18s either. Well, well thanks. I think a point that it's worth mentioning that a lot of po- people don't have not considered. It's, it's kind of obvious once you think about it for about five <laughs> seconds is that the early space program and the, and the dawn of the jet age, at least you know, as far as American industry is concerned, were, were concurrent activities. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's all late, well, early 50s, late 50s, into the 60s. It was all all happening at the same time. So yeah. there was a lot of innovation and a lot of a lot of crazy things, like you're saying, going on at that time. Yeah. I mean, there were prototypes, yep. some new prototype jet during the mid, late 50s and early 60s. I think like every four months, some new model was flying. You know, what, whatever it might be, you know, very rapid development, you know, and a lot of things didn't go, but, but very rapid trial and error stuff. Nowadays, it, you know, takes forever to get something new off the ground because, well, it's a different time and different technology. But, sure. Uh, it was very dynamic period. And, you know, X-Planes, I got a whole collection of X-Planes and lifting sure. bodies and Russian stuff. Russian space stuff has been something I've been fascinated by over the years as well oh yeah now did did scratch since since you were interested in something that there wasn't a lot of kits of you obviously had to resort to scratch building did it come natural to you did you have somebody who was teaching you this because it's not like today where if i want to learn how to scratch build this or that i can go on youtube put in what i want and you know the odds are decent that there's a YouTube video of it. Back then, that wasn't the case. So did you have guys in the club that taught you techniques, or did it just come naturally because you're an engineer? Well, it was a little bit of both. There were you know, guys, very talented guys in our club, so you kind of see what they're doing for basic techniques. And then you just kind of trial and error. You learn as you go. I mean, my early stuff, you know, like I say, those early ones in junior high was, was cardboard and wooden dowels. Okay. And then you get more and more sophisticated that, uh, I, I built a, um, in my dorm in college, a one twelfth scale Viking Mars robotic lander, but that was all plastic. You know, it was sheet styrene and, um, plastic tubing and beams and stuff and vacuum form parts. But so you, you kind of learn as you go. The, uh, the scratch built Skylab was, it, it's a cardboard tube with a uh, sheet of plastic painted and wrapped around it and chunks of metal just super glued together. And by the way, super glue will hold for 40 years because mine has. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> um, so it, you learn as you go, your skills develop. I know I started the Monogram 148th Lunar Module and I like scratch built a whole interior. And I got to a point where, 
um, I got to rebuild all the outside stuff and antennas and ladder and this and that and the other thing. And, and I stopped. And it sat on the shelf like 80% finished for 15 years until my skills got good enough where I felt confident enough to finish it up. And then it won like, you know, best sci-fi at the Nats or something. But space and sci-fi, yeah. So, yeah, it, 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 your skills build over time. I mean, you're not going to do a lot of the crazy stuff I do if you're just starting out. Well, that's a good point. Um, since you've said it, we're kind of in the golden age. There's quite a bit out there for real space. Where would somebody today who wanted to, to start exploring this genre as a, as a, as a hobbyist, uh, what would you recommend? Where, where, would, where would you start? Well, there's, you know, there's an outfit. Buddy of mine, Glenn Johnson, runs an outfit called Real Space Models. He's out of Florida. He does a lot of resin kits of uh, r- rockets and boosters, uh, and they're very well done. Another good source for Real Space Models, mostly boosters and rockets, is Newware out of Europe. Uh, he does really good work. And, and so between those two is a good place to start for, for modern rockets and boosters and things. They also have a lot of detailing sets. Like if you want to detail a lunar module or you want to detail your space shuttle, uh, they have photo etch add-ons for, for things like that. Um, so there, that's, that's a good place for kits there's a few others. Uh, what I offer in, in my, I have a series of books, the space and miniature books. It's for, we talked about not a lot of kits out there, but then the kits that are out there, eh, they're not all that accurate or they're not all that detailed. And what, what I offer, and I have other people who work with me on these books, will write up what they've added, how you can make a model, a, re, a plastic kit, a styrene kit, a Ravel or monogram or somebody's kit how you can make it more accurate and add detail. And I have a lot of historical references. And for, for example, on the Apollo, each Apollo mission, the, the details were slightly different on the spacecraft. And I've researched all that and distilled it for modelers. And so you can go there and find out, oh, what's the thermal blanket pattern or where was this antenna or whatnot. So we've done the research for you. Uh, I can point you to where you can make your own details or correct the kit flaws or go find a third party vendor who's got a correcting kit for you. So there's there's a lot more out there now. Again, people are 3D printing stuff. You can uh, get stuff from fantastic plastic, you know. Now they're limited runs, so they might be out of stock and you have to wait till they make some more. But like Manned Orbiting Lab, they had something called Big G, which is an oversized Gemini. Um, you know, X20, which never came, well, until recently, never came out on a styrene kit. Uh, just a lot of products out there that weren't available, like you say, 10 years ago. So, you know, we thought we were in a golden age in the eighties. No, this is, this is it now, the technology and the Eastern European stuff that these guys do great work. Well, well, Dave and I got some kits from Australia, from uh, horizon models. Mm. Another good supplier. Yeah. They make, they got a series of uh, historical boosters and 70 second scale. And I, I, I've got those. I haven't built it. I'm, I'm more on the, the stuff that gets to orbit than the rockets. But um, that's, uh, those are, they're very nice kids. Well, you, you raise an interesting question for me. And, and yeah, keep in mind, I'm, I am scale centric. 72nd scale is God's one true scale. One thing I notice in real space, it is hard to build to a constant scale. Because a satellite is, you know, if it's in a, a 72nd or 144th or something like that, it's super tiny. Whereas, obviously, if you're building in a larger scale for satellites, then your boosters and all would be incredibly large. Do, do scale matter to you at all? Well, you, you raise a good point, and that's, you're exactly correct. Depending on the the subgenre, satellites versus a space station versus a rocket, yeah, it, you can't achieve one scale. You have to split it up. Uh, most folks are kind of focusing on one twenty fourth scale for satellites. Uh, Fuji, Fujimi, I think, put out a couple of the Japanese probes that they were built in that scale. There's there's a couple other in that scale. Uh, that's what Glenn does a lot of his in one twenty fourth scale. I kind of go with that. Um, 
some of the classic kits can be found in 48th or more recently 72nd scale. If it's a rocket, basically 140, 1 to 144th is the way to go. Makes them all reasonable, and you can get most rockets in and boosters in 1 to 144th scale for a constant scale there. But yeah, you you can't you can't have everything because of the uh, breadth of size of that particular topic. Yeah, like a Saturn V with this little capsule on top, and it's. <laughs> I don't I don't see that as a problem. You know, you, yeah. you mean to just have to either pick something or you know uh, accept that you know your rockets are going to be one scale and your payloads going to be another scale. Yeah, I guess that's a good way to divide it up, rockets and payload. Well, you mentioned your uh your publishing. Let's let's talk about that a little more so so folks who are interested in this this genre can can know where to go and what I, what what uh specifically you do offer there in terms of uh sure. primarily reference material. Well, yeah. fir- first first question, how did you get into deciding to publish? This this goes back to St. Louis. We had our, our we had a gang in St. Louis, the club there. Um, this is, you gotta remember, you gotta go back in history now in, in this, in the hobby back in the seventies and eighties, the way you exchanged information about accurizing a model kit reviews, uh, paint patterns was, there was no internet fine yeah. scale modeler didn't start till what? 83. 84. Yeah, you know, so if no, like, so, so st- okay, seventies, early eighties, there's not much out there. You know, there was the uh, couple of the scale modeler and scale aircraft. You know, but th- those didn't have a lot, and that was it. Yeah. So what was happening is m- clubs would publish their own magazine style, often quarterly publications. There were some great club publications out there. There were. Like that's, I would recommend you guys go dig into the history of that and and celebrate those old club publications that, you know, were evolved into like the early IPMS journal and quarterlies. And yeah. oftentimes those articles would get published, republished in there. But clubs would do their own their own versions of a journal and a quarterly with reviews and and, and they would trade them amongst the clubs because we would swap them. So in St. Louis, the Gateway chapter there, we started our own magazine. We thought, well, this would be a fun project. You know, we could sell some, make a little money. But it was just kind of to get our stuff out there and, and, you know, serve the hobby. And we came up with the name. It was actually a takeoff, ironically, on the Phoenix Club, which had a publication called Dirty Plastic. So we thought we would call ours Crazed Plastic. A little double double meaning on crazed, but that, <laughs> that was our um, our magazine, and we put out I don't know like thirty some issues on a quarterly basis in the in the eighties, and it was a couple two three of us that were really interested in the space stuff. So my 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 buddy, his name's Mike Eastman. He's still around. We still correspond. He still digs up stuff for me. He and I would write these articles on Gemini and maybe X-20 and space shuttle stuff. And we'd publish them in, in this quarterly crazed plastic magazine. And um, after a while, I, I started, you know, trying to collect people interested in real space modeling. Because the other half of this story is that at the IPMS regional and national conventions, if you had a space shuttle or Mercury capsule, it went in miscellaneous. Yeah, because there was no space in sci-fi category, and and I was one of the people who lobbied to get those categories a- added, primarily represented by a guy out of Denver named Kevin Atkins. He's he passed away a few years ago. Great guy, and I representing the kind of the historical space side. We we would like load the categories up with entries. You got to add categories for us, and eventually they did, and. I have a whole kind of a history of the of the of the space and sci-fi categories, and it's grown over the years. But back in the early days, there was no such thing. So um, it, it was a way to get together. I wanted to kind of network people who were interested in this stuff, 
And I had some contacts from some of these other club magazines. And I started this little network uh, with a newsletter. This is like early 90s. Internet was just getting started. And uh, I call it the Scale Spacecraft Newsletter. And I started networking and getting this out, the word out to people that, hey, there's a bunch of guys interested in this. Let's organize and swap addresses and stories and stuff. And and that evolved into, hey, I should, let's make a, I should take my old articles out of crazed plastic and make little booklets out of them, put them all together, update them and have single topics. And then I get some of the guys from my network to contribute. And so the first book was on generic space modeling. And I had a bunch of guys contribute to that. It was called Scale Spacecraft Primer. And then we did one on Gemini and we did one on the space shuttle. And then we did one on the Mercury program. And it was some of the St. Louis guys and some of the guys from this network that we put together. And then eventually we'd start getting together at the Nats and Every year from then on, it built and built. We started, you know, the internet came along, which really helped helped us grow our little network. And uh, we have an informal real space modelers um, cadre that we've been getting together at the Nationals for many, many, many years. And it's it's a wonderful circle of friends. And they're very supportive of what I do and my other colleagues and guys like Glenn and guys who do resin kits and guys who have websites and uh, people who have, uh, you know, just to help, help promote this little piece of the hobby. I mean, we're a small niche in a small hobby. So we're just happy to be around and, and to have IPMS uh, happy to support the, not just the historical, but the sci-fi modelers too, who, who are, you know, no longer laughed out of the room. Well, well in, in your cadre of, of your tight-knit friends there, is one of them named Mike Ida-Cavage? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, he is one of the early ones. I think I still have the first letter I got from him back in the late 80s. Yeah, well, Mike's a great guy. He was, he was, he was a formative in, in, in my entry in this hobby. As he, he, we lived in the same area growing, when I was growing up as a teenager. And, uh, and uh, we had a reunion at the last national. So I thought I'd mention that because I, I figured you probably knew who he was. Cause it's a, yeah, we're it's a good t- Tight knit group you got there. Yes, it is. <laughs> how, how many how many publications in total do you have now? I've got I've got nine uh, full size booklets. They're like you know black and white magazine style. Uh, you know, they run from forty to sixty pages. Um, they're available in, in print or digital. Uh, there's nine titles, like I say, uh, Primer, which has been up. Some of these have been updated. Primer, Mercury, Gemini, Shuttle. Russian stuff, lunar module, Apollo command and service module, and space suits. And the most recent one is on the Gemini variants that never got built. And then more detail, because the original Gemini book was, you know, out of articles from Curry's Plastic from the 80s. And so the building Gemini goes into more about building the kit and building variants of it. So I have nine full-size titles. I have some short form ones that are only available as uh, digital downloads. I call them tech reports. I have like five of those on uh, the Nova rocket that uh, Ben Gunther built for one of the Nats. And he had this great write up there. He said, Hey, I can make this into a book. He said, sure. So he got how he did that. Um, Mir space station, um, you know, a few other topics like that, that are kind of very, very narrow, very focused. And um, might not otherwise have as much appeal. So I, I didn't go through because it's expensive to print stuff, as you can imagine. Oh, so yeah. some of them are just digital. Yeah. And digital does seem to be the way to go for a lot of the hobby related and, stuff. And I love that because I don't have to go to the post office to mail <laughs> things. You know, <laughs> somebody somebody presses a button on my website and they order a book and they get they get it in the email link. And, and there you go. Are you are you working on another one currently? I the last one was the uh, the building Gemini, which came out like a year or so ago. I have uh, something in the works uh, with a co- again. Sometimes I'll have somebody actually write the thing for me, and I'll lay it out and publish it. But I've got a guy uh, who's a very John Duncan. He's a very uh, well respected expert on the Saturn V rocket. He's 
putting something together for me on on the Saturn V. So it'll yeah. be, be just on that. And um, he's had some health issues, kind of slowed the process down. I was hoping maybe to be working on it this summer, but um, that that probably be the next one because I you know run out of major topics. I don't plan to do like the current stuff is too new to really cover you, and there's no there's no real kits. I mean, I could do something on the space station, but that's so complex and dynamic. I'm not sure I'm even going to attempt that. Um, I also, ha- I just noticed too, there is the U.S. and Russian missile set, strategic missiles, yes. has been re-released. Mm-hmm. And years ago, there was a guy out of the Chicago Spruce Stretchers Club. I believe it was the Spruce Stretchers or the Polish Coast Watchers, they were sometimes known as. A guy named Joe Suzinski, he passed away some years ago. But he wrote some great articles on accurizing that kit with a whole bunch of drawings. And I've received permission to reproduce his article. And I may put that out as a short form tech report for people. He goes into a lot of detail on how to how to upgrade that model. And now that it's being reissued, it might be time to do that. So I might come up with that. Well, here's something you might have some insight on. I know you've, you've been with the IPMS a long time. I uh, may talk about that a little bit as far as uh, your time in that society. But what I wanted to, to say is that I, th- I think one thing Dave and I have noticed over the last, uh, we'll call it post-pandemic, getting back into shows and stuff, is that the, the, the real space categories seem to be getting uh, a lot bigger than we remember them being uh, not all that long ago. And, and I think it's probably because – uh, there's kind of a renaissance in the industry right now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, service providers, SpaceX, Northrop Grumman, um, folks like that who are 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 providing lift for for all kinds of stuff. Uh, my company, my my employer included, and I think uh, it's kind of getting a lot of attention again. Um, so as as a a modeling genre, it seems to be growing. What do you think? I think. I keep track of the numbers. I haven't kept track as closely as when I was the head judge of that group, but I kept statistics and it kind of flattened out and it's not a huge, if, if you count, it's category 600. If, if you count just the category count, it's not really, I can't say it's growing. The sci-fi stuff is growing, it, 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 but it sometimes get real big and then the next year it drops a little bit. Um, the, the problem with the real space is there's no kit of the dragon. There's no kit of right. <laughs> the, the CST 100 from Boeing. There's, there's no dream chaser kit, all of this new space stuff. You have to find somebody who's designing and, you know, making 3d printed versions and you got to kind of mess with them. And if you can even get them and, uh, until that happens, it's not really going to blow up or take off. You know, uh, some and some of the subjects, frankly, are challenging. Like, how many space shuttles do you see at NATS? One every yeah. two years? Rarely. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, that's, a, that's a tough model to build. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's a product of the fact that those kits are challenging at best. Yeah, they're they're not that well detailed. They're um, you don't get much uh, add-ons. You know, they're old. Um, it, it's it's tough. It's tough area. Well, then that that modeler recently, I don't know if you saw that shuttle. Gosh, Dave, who was that? I think oh. it's a Japanese modeler. Yeah, God, there's some guys that are doing some crazy stuff. Uh, he yeah. like completely rescribed everything, every stinking tile. Oh, everything. that yeah, that guy, yeah, yeah. that's so, that's insane. So the shuttle's dead as a, as a modeling subject now because nobody will ever <laughs> dare go there, right? Yeah, <laughs> ever, ever top that. <laughs> well, I did uh, last year in Indy. Uh, uh, there was a guy who had a Falcon Nine with a dragon on top of it that was all 3D printed. That's it. And, That's the only way you get these right now. Yep. And you know, yep. I don't have a 3D printer. I haven't gotten to that yet. I, I what I I'm still old school. When I scratch build stuff, it's it's a box of styrene strip and whatever I can glom together. But I would love to I'm trying to learn CAD software 
So I can, you know, design replacement parts that, you know, I don't have to go and hack at every time. And and then if I need two of them, I can just print two, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm not there yet. I hope to get there sometime, but I'm, I'm not there right now. You've got, a, you've got a lot of resources out there for, for this, this genre. And there's stuff out there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of wonderful websites. Um, there's, there's great coverage of the current stuff. What needs to be happening is, and I don't know who's doing this, but someone needs to be, for example, keeping track of all these crew dragon flights. You know, each one's slightly different. You know, like they just had this free, this Axiom crew to right. the space station. You know, they had markings on there for that mission on the capsule. Yeah, And yeah. I think from the first crew dragon to the late latest ones around the thrusters, I think they were originally silver and now it looks like it's all white you know stuff like that is you know what i've covered for, for gemini capsule or to the or an apollo someone should be i'm collecting photos but someone should be like okay distilling all this stuff for modeler okay this one had a placard here this one it was purple you know this one was blue you know it, it, we need to be doing that we need to be collecting history while it's happening not wait 20 years yeah. Well, maybe this will this will bring some people out of the woodwork because I suspect somebody out there is doing that. Yeah, yeah. it's it's just just the way it goes. But e- uh, go ahead, Dave. Elon has a lot of fans, so I am oh, sure God. that there, I am sure there is somebody, and I count myself among them. Uh, I am sure there's somebody out there who is documenting all the all the Dragon and Falcon Nine stuff and the Falcon yeah. Super Heavies yeah. down to, down to the last inch. If you want a kit, it's 3D printed or pay a lot of money. Uh, it, yep. it needs to be a little simpler, I think, before it, it gets broader. And uh, I, I don't know when that's going to happen because I think it's it's a licensing thing and times yeah, maybe, change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know Boeing with Boeing, uh, licensing is everything. And, of course, now keep in mind that the Boeing Starliner just finally made yeah. A successful uncrewed flight. So now once it gets its first crewed flight in, I think then it becomes much more popular. We can, we can, you know, cross our fingers that maybe something's in the works. Who knows? Yep. You've also got a YouTube channel. Yeah. I, I started that a while back. Um, you know, I've always take photos of my work in progress because you use that in your, in my magazine type books. And I, I thought, well, I could just shoot some videos and explain what I'm doing while I'm doing it. And unlike some podcasts, I keep mine short. Um, <laughs> I, I I try to keep these these episodes to like five to seven minutes. And that way I can, you know, shoot them while I'm doing them, get them out there. And then, you know, a week later, shoot another five minutes showing the progress. Because you, you, you got to show the progress. If you wait too long, it's done. You've hidden something. So I got these short little (laughs) video snippets of various projects I've built the last five years. And um, they're they're under Space City Mike. You can go to – there's a link from my space. Spaceinminiature.com is my main website. And links to my Twitter and the YouTube can be found there. And uh, Facebook as well. And and so I got stuff on Baran, Russian stuff, um, a bunch of my Gemini projects. You know, I, what I've been doing lately is any weird Gemini thing that I can find enough info, I think I'm going to try to build that. And I keep finding more. So <laughs> document those. That's, that's fun stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> it, they're just another way to share my experience. And like I said, I've been building models for a long time and just – share little hints and how you, how you do scratch building or add detail or make a kit look a little more accurate or what color black is that? <laughs> I've got a question for you. You, you were, you were a uh, head space judge for IPMS for many, many years. Yeah. Give, give us a little perspective. Give us a judge's perspective of judging at a Nats and particularly judging this particular category at the Nats, because, you know, if you're, if you're an aircraft judge, 
and 48 scale single engine, whichever split or sub split you happen to be judging, you're looking at 22 models of the same darn kit. And so, you know, you're, you're compare, it's much easier to compare, you know, 22 of the same model as opposed to real space where you might have a, scratch built 12th or 16th scale satellite next to uh, the old airfix Saturn 1B. So give give us a little insight on judging and judging real space at an axe. That that's a real good observation that we've got such a diverse array of stuff in that category. I mean you'll have like I say a little a little space probe or a Luna landing thing on Mars or and then you've got an Apollo lander, and then you've got a rocket, then you've got a V2, and then you've got, you know, somebody with a cutaway Vanguard rocket, you know, it, it's so varied. You, but you just go back to your basic IPMS approach. Start with construction and paint. You know, is that fin square? Is there glue marks? Did he achieve what he intended to achieve? Um, is there fingerprints in the paint? How do the decals, if any, look? Uh, is is those landing legs square? And you just go through each one because what what's going to happen is you're going to look at that and you say, oh, there's a you know paint glob, or he's painted a rocket, but his black and white stripes are crooked, or they're not straight, or his masking didn't work very well or the, the faint finish isn't uniform. So you, you start eliminating things that way. But it comes down to the same basic approach with anything in, in the IPMS world of your, your start with basic construction and paint and glue and seams. And then you start finding you know your top five out of the 15 or 20 that are in there and you say, okay, these five, I haven't found any problems with them. They look really good. Let's start looking at, okay, are, are they scratch? Well, are they scratch built? Are they kit bashed? Are they straight out of the box? What the degree of difficulty here? You know, what did he, what did he maybe miss on? So it, it's like anything. It's not that much different. You, you got to go back to basics. You always go with the, always go with the basics and you'll be okay. Were you at uh, Las Vegas? Yes, sir. Give me your impressions of the real space category in Las Vegas, because Mike and I were there and we admired several of those models. Now, I know you weren't judging uh, uh, the category and weren't head judging the category, having having retired from probably the worst job in IPMS, which is judging uh, at a Nats. But I what still was your- help judge. I still help judge. I'm just not in charge. You're, you still, God, why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> I'm, I'm slowing down. I, you know, I don't think I judged the space category because uh, I think I had something going on. I got there a little late and they already had enough judges, which is fine. Because frankly, I can't judge the sci-fi stuff anymore. It's too wild and crazy. That yeah. stuff, you talk about hard to judge. It's like, oh my God. And and frankly, I've lost track of, you know, I don't know these kits anymore. You know, I don't know what's in there. Sure. Um, so last year's, I'm looking at my photos from last year. Um, again, we had one of the crazy uh, large soup scale, almost semi-scratch built lunar modules. Yeah. Uh, um, that's just crazy nuts work. Um, i trying to remember what else was there. Was that Lunar Lander 3D printed? It was 3D printed, and then he added a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. Yeah. And and, um, and, I, and, I, and I doubt it was 3D printed in one go. It was probably... Oh, it's a whole bunch of pieces, and it's oh, like yeah. six so, or $700 worth of, of parts. Yeah. <laughs> um, but So he, he ended up with a kit after he was done. It's basically a kit, but... Yeah. Um, what were your impressions of real space in Las Vegas? Was it, uh, did it seem like a normal number? Did it, did we, we know obviously 
We talked about the Lunar Lander being a 3D printed kit and all of the work that went into it to actually make it a presentable model. But overall, the impression, it seemed like there was a fair number of kits on the uh, real space category. It seemed like the, the variety was particularly large. Well, Mike and I know we're both very impressed by the quality of the items that were entered in that category at Las Vegas. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm really interested to see what it looks like in Omaha. Yeah, I think I think it, it it should be good again. People have been, you know, pent up uh building stuff, so um hope hope to have some things of interest there. Well, the one other question relating to judging that I had. It seems to me, and now keep in mind I religiously avoid judging. Uh I know that makes me a coward. I know I, I just it, I have so many things going on at the Nationals that Friday night is just, I can't carve out the time or haven't been able to. And I'm thankful to all of you out there who do. But it seems to me like the quality of all the models are getting better. I won't that, disagree with that. There's that some, the, yeah. The, that the skills are getting better, that people are, are, getting up to speed much quicker. I think there's also, you know, a lot of new tools and products out there. You know, there's some great, you know, like good putties and, and adhesives and new li- new paint lines. Yeah. Um, tools to make your, your job easier. Uh Photo etch stuff can result in some really spectacular work. And maybe that's a little bit of what we're seeing. And I do think the new kits, more modern kits are better engineered. Yes. So that it's easier to assemble kits than it yes. was in the 70s and 80s. That is true. Well, well Mike, you got a favorite subject within the genre? Something you... I, I, I have to say is is the Gemini program. As okay. I say, when I started my career, um, I worked for the guys who who built that, and I've just gotten fascinated. If if you look at concept art and studies from the early 1960s to the mid 60s, any any oddball space station or Air Force Space Lab or manned orbiting lab had a Gemini capsule floating around it. Or there was a Gemini capsule or two or three docked to it. And I've frankly been researching that in in a serious historical research approach, trying to figure out who who did all these studies? What was the story behind them? And um, there's a lot of stuff out there that I, I, for example, there were some Air Force studies in 1962. They had contracted studies. I've got documentation of that. And I'm trying to find, okay, these reports must exist somewhere, right? haven't found them yet but you know stuff like that would be fascinating what were they thinking what were they coming up with so yeah gemini is my favorite so i've been building all these gemini variants you know mcdonald looked at what if we had a rescue apollo guys on the moon could we put a gemini on the moon you know so you had that you had big g you had gemini with space stations you have gemini with the uh manned orbiting lab you have Wing Gemini, just just one Gemini Labs, it's just Gemini everywhere. So that's Gem- got to be my favorite. You, you got you got to include hang gliding Gemini. Oh yeah, the uh, the Regalo wing. Yes, that's that too. Well, that's what I what I brought to Vegas last year was my whole collection of Gemini variants. I believe it won. They split the collections category. Yeah, believe. I, I, it I remember that. it. Yeah. What's you working on now? Well, I just finished another Gemini variant. It was this 1962 <laughs> study called Military Operational Development System, which was a a um, two Gemini's docked to a a a ten foot lab, and docked is a uh, in quotes because it was some something they just kind of made up and uh, very conceptual. But I found a uh, a little line drawing of it and. Um, Turn that into a model, which I just finished. Well, and of course, keep in mind that that the first dockings were actually Gemini's. 
Um, that's that's true. That's true. At least for the U.S. Yes, US. for the U.S. But we we don't talk about the evil Russians. No, we don't talk about the Russians. <laughs> but yeah, that's that developed. That's what developed the technology that enabled Apollo to be successful. Yeah, that was the whole yep. reason for Gemini. And so you know, sometimes it's kind of a forgotten program, but it's um, uh, very important in in space history. I haven't missed the nationals in over twenty years. Been fortunate I, enough to be able to. I wish I could say that, but uh, but you're uh, dang close. Dave. Now, I've I missed <laughs> I missed South Carolina and I missed Colorado recently, but I, I've done twenty. My first one was Indy in nineteen eighty five. So that was the first one, but uh, I've done a lot of them. I keep telling everybody uh, who listen that uh, uh, the it's the best four days of my year every single year without oh, fail. It's, it's fun. It's it's a, the the funnest four days a yep. model builder can have, and you know the the more you go to, the better it is because it's your one shot to see people in person that you're. Yes networking in online all year and it's just it's so special yeah and in the vendor rooms you see uh uh start get to, getting to see stuff in person at a vendor's table is much different than just you know you can find anything online but getting to pick it up turn it over in your hands examine it etc is just radically different mm-hmm mm-hmm so, uh, so there's just something special about being there. You know, you got your world's largest hobby shop for four days. Yeah, I was. I've been more recently trying harder to catch seminars. That is to, you really learn a lot. Yes, to me, the seminars are the unsung uh, gems of the nationals. And I've Some been doing my, seminars for 20 years there too. I, are you I, doing one? Are you doing one this year? Yeah, I, I had a little trouble coming up with a topic, but I, I found myself building some lifting body models. So I'm going to do one on lifting bodies and space planes. Cool. Ooh, well, I'm going to survey what kits are out there. Uh, go through a few few of my builds and uh, just kind of you know overview of what's out there and what's not out there. I will definitely be in the audience for that one because uh, uh, I remember the X-20 dinosaur being the projected next step from Gemini. And yeah. that, uh, that always interested me. And now we finally have an injection molded kit of it. Yeah. Well, Mike, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We're running up right on an hour here. Uh, we look forward to seeing it at the Nationals, so I'm, I'm glad Dave brought that up. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about real space modeling before we before we let you get back to life in uh, Gilbert, Arizona? Well, like I say, it's it's a community. You know, we've got a, a great community we built over the years. Guys like Mike Idakavage, Sven Nudson, uh, R- Rob Shorey. Uh, there's so many more, but these guys, you know, have done great work with seminars with providing kits, uh, helping to network websites, you know, getting together at the Nets every year, uh, maintaining, we've got our own little email, uh, group, uh, that we communicate with. Um, it's a community like, like any other little community in the modeling, uh, universe. And, uh, it's a fun group. If you had any interest at all in it, you know, check us out. Check my website. I got links to other ones. We have a nice Facebook group, a couple of Facebook groups, historical space modelers there if you do Facebook. Um, we welcome anybody who wants to learn about it. All right. We're here well, to help. we'll make sure all those links get put somewhere where our listeners can certainly get to them. And uh, it's been real interesting. It's a genre that uh, I hope to dabble in as soon as I get something else done. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Well, Mike and Dave, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you guys. Look really look forward to meeting people in person, some of the podcasters this oh, summer yeah. in, in Omaha. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, it won't be long now. We're getting close. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, Mike, ha- have a good evening. And, uh, you know, it's Memorial Day for us when we're recording this. So hope your weekend's been good. And uh, we look forward to seeing it in, in Omaha. All right. Thank you. We'll look forward to it as well. And thanks again for the opportunity to be on your show. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Take care. Well, Mike, I got to say that uh, 
real space is an area where I have an interest in real life. Not so, I mean, uh, modeling to a lesser extent, but actually it's one of the areas that I follow in real life. Um, I, again, uh, like our guest, was a child of the 60s and 70s and grew up with uh, um, Mercury I was a little young for, but Gemini and Apollo and Skylab and the space shuttle and then the long void until we got to SpaceX and, and now Boeing Starliner. The developments are flowing fast and furious and... I I hope that real space follows on that and that we get a whole lot more of the real space, particularly the new real space stuff. Well, I, I like the historical stuff as well. And, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be real curious to check out some of his publications, see what kind of rabbit hole I can go down with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You definitely can. And you, let's face it, you're one to take a kit and tear it apart and, you know, scratch build half of it. So it sounds like there's some opportunity to do that. Well, it, some of the some of the boosters and stuff might give give me reason to, to not go quite that crazy, you know. Yeah. So, uh, Mike, uh, are you done with your modeling fluid? Not quite, but uh, done enough. So how does the bullet 10 year compare it to the bullet regular? The, the bullet 10 year has got a little bit more flavor to it. It's cause it's older. Right. You would expect that. I'm not sure how much older. I'm not sure how, how old the orange label actually is. And, and bullets got a high rye content. So it's, it's, it's got a, got a spice compared to some other bourbons. It's, it's more on that side of the, the bourbon spectrum. Fractionally more than 91 proof. So a little bit, a little bit hotter. A little hotter than, than than the orange label. I don't know. I think with that, that's kind of kind of canceled out by the flavor. I, I, it's 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 good, but it, you know it's, okay. it's 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 proportionally more expensive. So I don't I don't buy it very often. Sure, but when you have a kid graduate high school, it's a cause for celebration. I, I guess so. Well, how's the beer, Dave? Uh, well, the as I said, I my my wife accuses me of drinking girly beers. I mean, I'm not, I don't, don't like the American mass mar- market lagers, but I love wheat beers. I love uh, Hefeweizens, et cetera. So I don't often venture into Bach and Doppelbach, but this is not bad. Now it is technically a malt liquor. And so you get a lot of malt flavor. I can see this beer being one that you drink on a cold winter's night. <laughs> uh, when you're looking for something with a lot of body to it, it is definitely not the beer that you're drinking as you're mowing the backyard on a hot summer's day. It's way too heavy for that. All in all, it it again, given my prejudice against dark beers, I liked it a little more than I thought I would. Maybe the coming winter, I might drink another one again while I'm at the while I'm at the bench. Who knows? Well, I've I've had that. Well, I got one from from the same same guys that gave you that one, but I I I, right. I had I had had it before, and for me, it's just way way too malty, way too syrupy, sticky, sweet kind of tasting. It me. is all of those things. So it's even with the high ABV, it's a uh, high ish. It's not that high, but it's higher. Yes, than, I'm, higher right. Than, it's higher than a Bach, right? Because it's double, right? Yeah, it's a Doppelbach. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's it's not one I would go back to very often. I understand. So, Mike, uh, you got any shout outs? Uh, I've got a couple shout outs. I do, Dave. Okay. Hit it. Uh, we got Patrick Colt from right here in the United States. And uh, you mentioned before Alex Taylor out of the UK. Both those gentlemen have uh, decided to support the show in some capacity. Uh, if you'd like to be like them, you can support the show in a couple of ways. You can go to www.patreon.com slash Plastic Model Mojo. And there you can make a recurring contribution uh, from uh, your choice of a dollar on up to whatever you would like to contribute to our, our little endeavor here. And it's all appreciated. Very much appreciated. If you want to do a one-time donation or manage your own recurring contribution, uh, you can do that at PayPal. 
if you go to plastic www.plasticmodelmojo.com, there's a heart icon in the upper right hand corner of the screen. You can use that to go straight to our PayPal uh, portal and uh, make a one time or manage your own recurring contribution there. Folks, we say this every episode, and, and we really mean it every episode. Absolutely, uh, we do. It's, it's very humbling that folks will uh, support the show with their wallet. And yes, it, it means a lot that we mean that much to you. So we appreciate it. Every, every, every nickel, every penny, every dime. Thank you very much. Yes. It's very affirming to, uh, to Mike and myself and, and we do really, really appreciate it. And we're humbled by it because, you know, people, people choosing to support us in that way is, is just wonderful. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned Mr. Taylor and his support for the podcast, because one of my shout outs was actually brought about by uh, our recent exchange. And I want to shout out all the listeners, particularly the ones that reach out to us via email or instant message. You know, I, I've said it a number of times before, but the biggest surprise the biggest surprise from doing this podcast is the community that got built that i i didn't at all think about or expect um and and the number of friends the number of people that i exchange information with and not only answering stuff but getting people to tell me stuff and uh, uh i just I, I really appreciate it. So shout out to all of the listeners out there who reach out and contact us. All right, Dave. Well, I think we're at the end of this one. I think so, too. As we always say, Dave, so many kits. So little time. See you soon, Mike. See you soon. I'll keep stuff